Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Tim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. In this episode, we're talking with engineer Bob Durfee about the bridge right Peter Paddleford and his unique truss. Learn why, even though it was never patented, the Paddleford Trust dominated covered bridge construction in northern New England for many years. Today, there are only 22 Paddleford covered bridges left, and Bob will tell us all about it. Here we go. In this episode, we will learn about bridge builder Peter Paddleford and his unique truss. Paddleford was born in 1785 in Enfield, New Hampshire, and later moved to Littleton, where he made his living as a millwright and a bridge builder. While Paddleford constructed only about seven covered bridges in his lifetime, his truss design was employed in over 100 covered bridges in Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. Today we're talking to Bob Durfee, Vice President and Chief Bridge Engineer at Dubois & King in Laconia. Bob holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Clarkson University and a Master of Engineering degree from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Go Hokies! Bob is a nationally recognized expert on covered bridges and is a noted author of technical papers, publications, and presentations on bridge and structural engineering. He is a licensed professional engineer in eight states and has over 45 years of professional experience in transportation and structural engineering. Bob is a founding member and past president of the Structural Engineers of New Hampshire and was the 2008 New Hampshire Engineer of the Year. Bob was instrumental in supporting my research as he has worked on several New Hampshire covered bridge projects, including the Ashwilot, Bath Village, Blair, Sillyville Bog, Coombs, Corbin, Friendship, Haverhill Bath, Mount Orne, Pier, Slate, Smith, Stark, Sulfite, Swiftwater, Thompson, Whittier, and Wright's Bridges. Welcome to the podcast, Bob. Thanks, Kim. You've worked on almost every bridge. (laughs) <laughs> That's great. So thanks for talking with me today. Today we're going to talk about Peter Paddleford. When Peter was 39 years old, he built his first covered bridge in 1834 across the Connecticut River, the McIndo Falls Lyman Toll Bridge, which was a long truss. And then nine years later, he built another covered bridge, the Guildhall Toll Bridge in Northumberland, which was also a long truss. So let's start with the long truss. Can you tell us about that? Yes, the Long Truss is a patented truss. It was patented by Colonel Stephen Long in 1830. Uh, Long uh, was born in New Hampshire, I believe Hopkinton, and he was educated at Dartmouth, and then he went into the military as an engineer. His patented truss consists of interlocking triangular members. These members consist of a top cord and a bottom cord, which are parallel to each other over the length of the truss. Vertical post or vertical members, which are spaced along the truss, forming a panel. And then cross bracing in an X pattern that uh, extends from the uh, opposite corners of that panel. So truss, uh, so so Long's uh, patented truss was an improvement over the previous uh, town lattice, which the town lattice required an awful lot of timber because the the uh, interconnecting uh, bracing members were uh, lapped or layered in a, a lattice pattern. So there was a lot of timber required to build a a town lattice. With a long truss, there was only two bracing members or cross members in a panel point. Uh, one uh, called the diagonal or, or brace, and then the uh, which usually uh, was at an incline uh, facing uh, the, the length of the truss, heading, heading to the middle of the bridge. And then there was a counter brace that formed the X pattern, and the counter brace went uh, from the middle of the bridge out to the abutments or the end of the truss. So uh, Long's uh, patent and Long's design required a lot less timber and therefore was more cost effective. 
And how would a bridge builder gain access to the Long Trust patent? Could he just use it, or was there a process they had to go through? We really don't know what happened at the time, but uh, Long uh, patented his his trust in 1830, and that and when you received a patent from the patent office in Washington, there was certainly paperwork involved. Uh, the patent application consisted of uh, a written description of the trust, how it worked, and how you would build one, and also would include uh, sketches or drawings of how that trust would look like. What I also uh, learned from uh, research at the uh, patent office is early patent applications were required to not only provide a written application with drawings, but also to submit a model of your product that you're trying to get patented. So Long probably had to build a small model, maybe two or three feet long, to send into Washington. So any bridge builder that wanted to build a Long Trust certainly could contact Stephen Long by mail and request the, the use of his patented trust. And I'm assuming that uh, Long would charge royalties or a fee for someone to use his trust. So that's what, that was how other uh, bridge builders would learn about the Long Trust. They could also uh, uh, certainly go see a bridge that had been built by Long using the long trust and figure it out for themselves. For Ithiel Town's patent, they, he would charge a dollar a foot if you asked to use it and then $2 a foot if they found out that you used it without asking. And, and I would assume that in those times, maybe people just picked up designs from bridges that they saw and, right. and did them. Well, I assume that uh, Long did uh, charge royalties for use of his patent, because there is some uh, documentation that uh, when another engineer, uh, Howe, patented his trust in, I think that was 1840, uh, Long uh, claimed uh, patent infringement and went after uh, Howe for patent infringement of his Long Trust, because the Howe Trust was in my opinion, a modification of uh, the Long Trust. After building two Long Trust bridges, Paddleford um, started using his own trust design in 1846 with the Smith Eastman or the Joel's Bridge that was in North Conway. And his design was also considered a modified Long Trust. Can you, can you explain what that means? I know it's hard to explain without looking at a visual perhaps, but... Yes. Well, going back to the long truss, parallel top and bottom cords, vertical post members between the top and bottom cord, and then X bracing throughout, symmetric X bracing or diagonal bracing. Paddleford's truss uh, was a modification of the long truss in that the top and bottom cords were still parallel. The, the post members were still vertical between the top and bottom cord, but the cross bracing or diagonals extended outside of that rectangular panel. Typically the bracing members, which were angled forward towards the middle of the bridge, would not intersect at the top cord and at the post at the same point. The, the brace would extend or lap over the post and intersect the top cord or bottom cord farther down the, the truss. And the same thing with the counter brace. The counter braces uh, started somewhere on the, let's say the bottom cord, went upward, crossed a vertical post, then crossed a diagonal, and then intersected the top cord. 
So the modification was basically in a different layout in the bracing and diagonal bracing that extended farther beyond the vertical posts. It doesn't seem that Paddleford had any formal training in building bridges. In, in his earlier bridges, he followed a patented design created by Long, but here he's doing his own thing. How did the early bridge builders know how to build bridges or how to modify somebody else's truss design? Well, the early bridge ben builders were, were not engineers, and yes, they were bridge builders, and if, and for covered bridge construction, you had to be a, a good bridge right, meaning someone that was very familiar with working with large timbers and timber joinery and harvesting uh, the trees that were all local and having them uh, sent to a sawmill to either be sawed or some of the early cover bridges, they were actually uh, uh, the, the trees or logs were, were, were cut at the site called hewing, where they took a, an axe or a, a hewing tool and they just chopped those logs into rectangular timbers. So the I, I there there is some uh, documentation that or, or history on several uh, covered bridges that uh, covered bridge builders just kind of learned on the job and then they experimented. They tried a a new truss design or they built a longer bridge with a certain type of truss that was longer than the previous bridge that was built and they just experimented with uh, increasing the member size or changing the configuration of a truss. And if it worked, great. If it didn't work, well, typical covered bridges would fail either, uh, they, you know, they would just collapse under the weight of a heavy wagon or they get blown down in a hurricane or they get washed off their abutments from a freshet or a flood. And there's a lot of, uh, there's several covered bridges in New Hampshire that uh, that we presently see that are the second, third, or fourth covered bridge at that site because the first three failed. And then the bridge builder just built it back higher and better. Paddleford's truss design is considered complicated joinery. Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's complicated joinery. Uh, for one, and also with the Swiftwater Bridge, it's a good example of how uh, they modified that bridge three or four times, changing uh, the geometry of the members, but still being consistent <laughs> with the Paddleford layout. So a Paddleford truss is considered complicated joinery, and that's because uh, those braces and cross braces are are notched where they intersect either a vertical post or a top and bottom cord. And they're also notched where they pass over another member. So the counter braces in a Paddleford truss are the most complicated. They're first notched where they connect to the bottom cord. They're notched again where they pass over the diagonal, which is going in the opposite direction. They're notched a third time when they cross the post. And then they're notched a fourth time when they are intersect and attached to the top cord. So there's a lot of uh, joinery involved. It's usually lap joints or notch joints. And that, at the time, was very difficult to do with hand tools. Basically, you had saws and chisels. So it, it required uh, a very skilled bridge right. And, and how did that improve upon the long truss? Did it make a better bridge, or is it just a different type of truss? Well, it made... It improved on the long truss and made a better bridge because of the joints. With these joints being notched, uh, they became uh, 
very rigid and became and then the overall trust became very stiff and the stiffer the trust the stronger it is and the more load it can support so with these uh uh, complicated joinery in the uh, uh, Paddleford Trust. Paddleford was able to uh, reduce the size of the timber members, therefore less timber required and less cost, and able to support more load over the long truss, at least in theory. And in practice, I, I have seen where I've looked at long trusses and then looked at Paddleford trusses, and Paddleford trusses use very small braces and counter braces. They're typically three inches by eight inches, where long truss cross bracing can be very large. I've seen eight by eight or 10 by 10 square members. Uh, so I think that's where uh, Paddleford was trying to improve is to make his truss more rigid, more stiff, therefore more stronger, and then able to reduce the size of the timber members in construction. Okay. So you'd say, in theory, the Paddleford truss has a higher load limit than a long truss, but not always. Not always. They're difficult to analyze and they're difficult to construct. And and I know that um, I've I've heard before that sometimes bridge builders would modify a truss because they didn't we, they, we think we didn't they didn't want to pay royalties on a patented truss. Do you think that that might have been the case here, or do you think he was just trying to build a better bridge? I think he was trying to build a better bridge. If you, if you look at the timeline, he. He started using his Paddleford truss in 1846. The long truss pat patent uh, had expired in 1845. You know, trusses in the early, well, patents in the early 1800s only had uh, patent rights were only granted for 15 years. But the Howe truss uh, was still invoke and uh, how trust patent didn't uh, expire until uh, 1855. So maybe uh, Paddleford was really trying to uh, come up with a new uh, trust design so that he didn't have to use the how trust, but he certainly could have continued uh, building long trusses because the patent had expired. So I really think he he came up with his long truss as his means to come up with a better mousetrap or, or better truss. Paddleford was never granted his own patent. Do, do we know why? Well, as far as I know, he never applied for a patent. <laughs> That'll so, do it. <laughs> so I don't think there's any record of him ever applying for a patent. And he probably felt he didn't have to. He he could build a long truss if he wanted to. Uh, the patent had expired, and I think he just decided he was going to build his own truss design because he thought it was better. That makes sense. Why go through all the paperwork if you don't need right. to? <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and why he never patented his truss in order to... Uh, provide some protection, uh, who knows why. He mm -hmm. certainly built a lot of uh, Paddleford trusses in covered bridges. And uh, as we'll get into with some of your later questions, he passed on his knowledge and experience to his other bridge rights that worked mm -hmm. for him. And they continued building Paddleford trusses. Yes, they did. His, the historian Lola Bennett 
is quoted as saying, though never patented, the Paddleford Trust dominated covered bridge construction in northern New England for over half of a century. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure why. I think it has to do with geography. Peter Paddleford uh, was born and raised in New Hampshire. He lived in Plymouth for a time, or no, uh, Littleton, I believe it was. And almost all the Paddleford truss bridges that he, const he constructed or that his uh, son constructed or that other bridge right con bridge rights constructed were pretty much in the North Country, northern New Hampshire, also in northern parts of Maine and northern Vermont. I think that was his backyard, and he just didn't have any competition. Right, and that's building. Right, and my next question is, you know, why the the bridge rights, Jacob Barry and his son, who was also named Jacob, which is very confusing when you're doing research. Um, they used the, the Paddleford, as did Charles Broughton from the Conway area. And I guess, like you said, they all lived in the same area and probably worked in conjunction with each other to build covered bridges. So it would make sense that they would use Paddleford's design. Yes. Yeah, so Jacob Barry and his son, Jacob, and Charles Broughton uh, built the Saco River Bridge at Conway. And that was in 1850. Uh, Paddleford retired in 1849, but he was involved in the Saco River Bridge. So I think that's where he passed on his knowledge and expertise on the Paddleford Trust. And then, you know, Barry and Broughton saw, were now familiar with this and type of trust. And it was, I think, very easy for them to sell their new bridges. This, this 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 trust type for a new bridge. Uh, what I have seen in a lot of the history is that a lot of towns, uh, when they were uh, looking to uh, build a bridge, or they would have a town meeting where the select board would propose, you know, to raise. Uh, $3,000, $2,000 to build a bridge over a river in their town. Once they raised the money, somehow the word got out through newspaper articles that uh, this town had money to and wanted to build a bridge. And I think it was half that the, uh, the select boards went out and started looking for capable bridge engineers to give them a price to build their bridge or that bridge builders found out that, you know, particular town had raised some funds and they kind of sold their product. They, so, so uh, certainly Paddleford and his uh, son, Henry, and also the uh, Berries and the Brotons, I think went around the North country and sold the Paddleford trust as the most economical trust for them to build, and also one that they were very familiar with on how to build. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Many covered bridges, and especially many Paddleford Trust covered bridges, have arches that are added. Can you talk a little bit about why we would add arches to covered bridges? Arches are added to covered bridges to uh, strengthen the bridge and increase the what we call the live load capacity or the, you know, vehicle capacity. In New Hampshire, that was driven by an act in the state legislature that was passed in 1913 that required all bridges in New Hampshire, either be state, county, or municipally owned, to be safe for a 10-ton load. Back in 1913, a 10-ton load was probably a uh, wagon making deliveries from a local brickyard. So what we see after 1913, oh, in this act, uh, so what we, we see after this act was uh, passed in 1913 is that it gave the, the municipalities two years to complete this task. 
So by 1915, all towns either had to demonstrate that they had bridges that were safe for 10 ton load or they had to strengthen them. And in New Hampshire, we see that's when a lot of these arches were added into covered bridges or retrofitted into covered bridges. Uh, some towns were later than others in complying and didn't really get around to it until they, the early 1920s. Uh, there is one exception to that, the uh, Wrights Covered Bridge in Newport, New Hampshire. That is a railroad covered bridge. It uses a town lattice truss, but the arches were installed during the original construction which was in 1905. Mm -hmm. So that's the only bridge that I have ever uh, discovered that the original design and construction included a laminated arch. All other laminated arches were retrofitted. Okay, they were added bridges. after that act, yeah. Right. And that makes sense to me because when these bridges were built, there were no U-Haul trucks and box trucks and <laughs> tractor trailers and right. heavy vehicles. So, right. Our experience on covered bridges over the years, when we were analyzing these bridges to see how much load they can carry, we typically find that the uh, floor framing is the weak link or has the least capacity. What we typically find is the floor decking or floor planks can support a three to six ton vehicle load. Mm -hmm. The floor beams, which are the, which are the cross framing that goes from one, one side truss to another, mm -hmm. again, that usually has a capacity of three to six tons. The trusses are much higher, 8 to 10 tons. Sometimes I've seen even 12 tons. So it stands to reason that if uh, this 1913 Act required covered bridges to support a 10-ton load, how are they going to retrofit the bridge to do that? Mm -hmm. well, what they typically did is they installed a timber arch which was made up of individual laminize of typically two by two inch by thick by 12 inch wide planks that were stacked upon each other to make a truss that was anywhere from 30 to 42 inches thick. Mm -hmm. And then bent that to shape inside the bridge and then bolted or nailed it all together. Then they attach what we call hanger rods, which are steel rods that uh, attach directly to the arch. And then also mm -hmm. at the bottom of these hanger rods are attached to the floor beams. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, what they're trying to do in theory was to make the arch uh, strengthen the floor frame, which they, they even knew was a weak link. And, and increase the capacity of the floor framing, specifically the floor beams, uh, from three to six tons to ten tons. Okay. That makes sense. That's what we saw on the Whittier Cover Bridge in Ossipee. That's a Paddleford truss. I think it was built in 1870. Mm -hmm. And as near as we can tell, laminated arches were added in the early 1920s. Mm -hmm. And they uh, connected hanger rods between the arch and the floor beams. And so when we, uh, when we teamed up with, uh, when uh, Du Bois and King teamed up with Stan Great and 3G Construction to re rehabilitate the superstructure, we had to go through and analyze all the components of the bridge. And the goal was to uh, make sure that the bridge was capable of supporting a six ton live load. And we went back to the uh, to their 
someone's original concept, which was to uh, reinstall the hanger rods and strengthen the arch and adjust the hanger rod tension so that it only supported the six ton live load and that the trusses support all the dead load, you know, weight of all the timbers okay. and also support any snow load that is applied to the roof. Okay. It was, it was kind of, it was, it was difficult to try and uh, make that load share in, in our design analysis and design and let alone a lot tougher for Stan Grayton to construct it in the field. I know. I know. Well, it's back across the river now. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was there when they moved it uh, two weeks ago. Nice. Uh, that was that was interesting. It was fun for me, but also it was a little uh, uh, stressful. Because, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> well, they're they're. The, the current contractors, CPM constructors, uh, they built uh, slide beams over the river to mm -hmm. basically slide the Whittier Covered Bridge back on its abutments. They, they put the Whittier Bridge on rollers mm -hmm. and then slid it over these slide beams. And uh, the boys in King designed this whole slide beams and the uh, and uh, all the shoring that went with it. So we were out there during the move, and while they're sliding this bridge over over the river, you know, you're hearing this creeping and this creaking and bangs, and you know, every time you heard a, a noise that you weren't. I, I I've experienced this this type of move before, and also and in and in timber, you always get creaking. You know, just mm -hmm. like in an old house when you walk around. Right. But uh, still, it, it can be nerve wracking. I can imagine. It went well, you know. Good. You know. Paddleford's son, Philip Henry, who I believe went by Henry, uh, when he was 20 years old, he started working with his dad and eventually took over the business when his father retired in 1849. And Henry was an accomplished bridge builder in his own right. What What do we know about him? Well, Henry started working for his father in 1835, again, when he was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And when uh, his father retired in 1849, he still kept up the business. Mm -hmm. And so he built several covered bridges. Uh, we don't know which covered bridges he built with the Paddleford Trust. We don't have it any accurate records on, on that. Mm -hmm. But we know he built bridges, and we assume mm -hmm. he built Paddleford Trust-type bridges. So he, st he was still building bridges for 28 years after his father retired, until he retired. Mm -hmm. And along the way, he teamed up uh, with the Berries and the Brotons to build mm -hmm. Paddleford Trusses. Mm -hmm. We also know that he was a very prominent figure in his hometown. I think he also lived in Littleton. Mm -hmm. And he built several buildings and several sawmills and also managed, owned and managed several sawmills. And eventually he went into politics. I think he was a uh, state rep to the New Hampshire legislature. Mm -hmm. So is the Paddleford Trust still in use today? Do, do people still use it? Not that I'm aware, and I cer certainly won't use it in a new design, just because it is it is very complicated and difficult to analyze and design. Mm -hmm. Because of all these additional joints. Typical truss, you have your verticals, your diagonals, and your cord members all meeting at one point. Mm -hmm. along the truss, called a, called a panel point. Mm -hmm. With uh, Paddleford truss at every panel point, instead of having one connection, you've got one, two, three, four to six connections. Right. 
And so as an engineer, you have to analyze more connections. And, and, with, and I don't know how engineers did it before computers, you know, with hand calculations. Uh, you know, it would, it would take days of pages and pages of calculations to figure this out. Now we have computers, but still, it's difficult with computers because it's a very complex model that you're trying to create on the computer and then run the model and it never works the first time and then you have to figure out what went wrong and tweak it and finally get it right and then figure right. out where all the forces are going and then size your members. Mm -hmm. And then in construction, uh, you know, it's just very labor intensive to do all this joinery. So that's mm -hmm. the real, uh, the real uh, reason that we're not using Paddleford trusses mm -hmm. in current design and, and construction because uh, it's just so cost prohibitive for, for so much labor to do all this joinery. Right. And it's hard to find uh, experienced bridge rights. You know, this is a this is a trade that is being lost. Mm -hmm. e even when uh, you know, with uh, you know, current tradesmen and technology, they're using power tools and and milling machines to mm -hmm. cut these joints in the shop. But then when they're sent to the field and assembled. You still need an experienced bridge right out there with a chisel mm -hmm. and saw to fine tune these joints because they have to, to uh, fit exactly perfect and be very tight and rigid. Mm -hmm. And my next question was over the hundred or so Paddleford Trust covered bridges in this area, there were only 22 left. And, and I'm thinking I know why. I mean, it seems like perhaps if those bridges needed to be worked on, was it too too much, too much work for people to do? Do you think they just took them down and put up something easier? I, I think the latter. They, they just took them down and put up something easier. Mm -hmm. Over time, there's probably more than 2,000 covered bridges in this country. Mm -hmm. And now we're left with somewhere between 750 and 850. Mm -hmm. They've they've been lost due to a combination of uh, arson, uh, floods, or mm -hmm. neglect. And neglect is probably the most common. You know these uh, these covered bridges were built in the uh, last. Well, two centuries ago in the 1800s, and they just don't have the load capacity to keep up with our modern transportation and heavy mm -hmm. truckloads. Right. So they were, they when uh, st steel trusses became more prevalent for bridge construction starting in the 1890s, they just started replacing uh, covered bridges with steel truss bridges because they mm -hmm. had greater capacity. Mm -hmm. So how important is it that these 22 Paddleford Trust covered bridges stay? Well, it's very important that we preserve our covered bridges, all covered bridges, not only mm -hmm. Paddleford Trusses. Right. Uh, one reason is to preserve our history and heritage. Mm -hmm. Covered bridges are predominantly an American concept. There are more covered bridges in the United States than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Covered bridges are our link to our past. They present a simpler time in our country's history before the advent of automobiles, trains, planes, and other modes of transportation. Covered bridges are a testament to the skill and craftsmen of the 19th century tradesmen who built these bridges with no modern equipment using hand tools, oxen, and horse teams. Very well that said. That was my direct quote from a paper I published on the subject several years ago. That was excellent. One of my uh, closing statements when I uh, lecture on cover bridges and the need to preserve is I say, if we do not, pres 
if we do not begin to preserve what we have in our covered bridges, then at some point we will have nothing left to preserve. Mm, that's a powerful statement. So I have to ask you, do you have a favorite Paddleford bridge? I have each Paddleford bridge that I've worked on is different. Mm -hmm. I would say my favorite is the Swiftwater bridge in Bath. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first Paddleford truss I worked on. And it was very interesting because over time they had first constructed the Swiftwater Bridge as a single span. Mm -hmm. Then they, at some point, decided to increase the capacity by installing a pier and making a two span, and then they modified the, the truss accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then the pier washed out during a flood, so they decided to eliminate the pier, but replace the support provided by the pier by adding laminated arches, again, modifying the Paddleford truss again. Mm -hmm. And then when I got involved in a renovation in, uh, I forget what year that was, uh, we removed the arch and, I mean, we removed the uh, laminated arch and we reconfigured the, the Paddleford truss for, I think it was the fourth time. Wow. So that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and another reason is probably my favorite because of the location. It's right next to uh, a beautiful waterfall and beautiful setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the town swimming hole. Mm -hmm. It is a really nice setting. Is that is that the bridge you worked on where they, the townspeople came and brought you cookies and hot chocolate because it was like 10 below zero? Oh, yeah, was that a, was that different? Uh, yeah, that was a one. Uh, we it, there's no no plans uh, have ever survived any of these historic covered bridges. Uh, probably was, ne was never any plans developed. Maybe just some sketches in the builders, you know, file. But so when we get involved in a covered bridge. Our first task is to go out and measure up the bridge to produce existing drawings, what we mm -hmm. call uh, record drawings or, <clears throat> or as-built drawings. So for Swiftwater, I believe we did our initial inspection and, and measure up assignment uh, in January. And it happened to be the coldest January day for that year. It was started out at uh, minus 15 below when we showed up. Wow. In the dark because now it was daylight savings time. Right. <laughs> at seven o'clock. And it warmed up to a balmy zero degrees by one o'clock in the afternoon. So, <laughs> yeah, so fortunately uh, for us, we were we were dealing directly with the select selectmen in Bath, and one of the selectmen's and one of the selectmen lived just down the road on the far end of this bridge, and his wife was a stay-at-home mom, and so she she baked us cookies and brought us hot cocoa. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, there's nothing like being outside in a nice New England winter. Right, and that's. You know, that's that's a whole nother topic for me is I really like working on covered bridges because they're very different uh, than any other bridge that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. First, there's no standards in how you design a covered bridge or analyze a covered bridge or repair a covered bridge. It's all hands-on experience, mm -hmm. you know and just learn over your career and figure out what works and then what doesn't work, you learn from that lesson and get it right the next time. Right. But also working on covered bridge projects, they have such a, a loyal following. You know, when, mm -hmm. when we work on a, 
the traditional steel or concrete covered bridge and we go in and have a meeting with a select board or have a public presentation in town and present, you know, what we're doing and what we're proposing for a new bridge. The only thing the public cares about is, okay, how long is the road going to be closed? <laughs> and how much is it going to cost us to replace this bridge? And what are you going to finish? Right. You know? But when you get involved in a cover bridge, everybody comes out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. we, we affectionately call them covered bridge enthusiasts. <laughs> and everybody has their own opinion and expertise. Yes. Which is great because mm -hmm. you get such a you get such a following and you get support for what you're trying to do. You're trying to save mm -hmm. a covered bridge and right. rest, restore a covered bridge. And you get such a strong following and input. Uh, and they all want you to do the same thing. Just do it right. And do it right, right the first time. Right. Well, and I think it's because in a lot of communities, it's because of those people who come out and speak up and want to be involved and want to save the bridge. And in some cases, raise the money to fix the bridge that those bridges right. stay, which is a, a pretty powerful message that I found when I researched different, different communities. It's because of those bridge people or covered bridge enthusiasts. Right. There's certainly a few, uh, enthusiasts that come out of the woodwork and are, you know, opposed to the project or opposed to how, the town is going to proceed with the project or have a different idea of how to repair it or, you know, feel that uh, the town should use a different engineer or a different contractor or, you know, a different, uh, what we call a delivery system to uh, mm -hmm. design and uh, uh, repair a covered bridge. Mm -hmm. And most of the time those detractors, you know, in the end, you can win them over. It's all about uh, good communication and mm -hmm. perseverance and also recognizing that, hey, they have good intentions. They just have mm -hmm. the wrong approach. Right. And if you can, you know, win them over to your side in the process, uh, all the better. And that's Excellent. what you're really supposed to do with the public public yeah. process and all these meetings that we have on covered bridges with the public is true is trying to gain public support and win mm -hmm. over the detractors. Right. Right. Well, there are a lot of stakeholders involved in every covered bridge project. It's a lot of, a lot of people to balance. Yes. And again, uh, I, I look forward uh, to that public participation and enthusiasm because I don't see it on other bridges on other steel and concrete bridges they're no. never get any questions <laughs> no uh, except from the, from when the is it going to be or, open <laughs> yeah or or from the the, the townspeople and uh, usually what you know when there are any questions they're usually uh hey you know or when we have questions for them uh, like, w how would you like us to repair this bridge or build a new bridge? Would you rather have a steel bridge or a concrete bridge or an arch bridge? And they said, hey, you're the engineer. You decide. <laughs> you don't care. You know? But on a covered bridge, no. You, yeah, you it's totally you different. You never get that. Exactly. And, I, and exactly. I and I enjoy that interaction. I really do. That's great. Well, I thank you for all the work that you've done on so many of New Hampshire's covered bridges, and I am grateful for your support of this project and for sharing your research with, with me and for talking to me today about Peter Paddleford. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me to this uh, program, and I'll give you a plug. Is uh, I did receive uh, your book in the mail, uh, and I've read it, and uh, it's... Uh, awesome book. I've never, I have a lot of covered bridge books in my library, but this one is the most detailed on New Hampshire bridges, especially the history and just how things came about, not only on its original construction, but all the modifications that uh, came about and, and the colorful history on each bridge. That's what I really 
enjoyed in your book. Great. Each well, bridge, you. cover bridge in Hampshire has a story. Some good, yes, they some do. bad, but yes. they all came out in the <laughs> end that they all did the right thing. That is true. Well, thank you so much. And well, uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on this podcast. Okay. Great. Look Thanks, Bob. To. See you later. Bye. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Thank you.